Hello, and welcome to the uh, New Jersey Axe Team Science Virtual Seminar Series, sponsored by the Team Science Corps. And my name is Dan Horton. I'm one of the core co-leaders, along with Nancy Reichman and, and Ralph Gelati. And we're glad that you can join us today. Um, as you may know, this seminar series features different uh, biomedical research teams and team leaders from across the New Jersey Axe Consortium who are performing high impact multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary research, uh, including those funded by uh, NIH project or center grants, uh, as well as large foundation grants. And uh, we uh, generally ask our uh, guests to provide a high level, over high level overview of uh, their themes, about their projects, um, and then we ask them to comment on different aspects of, uh, you know, being on and, and running these, uh, these teams and these uh, team projects, uh, including or so that we uh, can learn from their successes, uh, as well as the, the challenges that they've overcome. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ralph to introduce today's guest. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dan. So it's a pleasure to see all of you. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce today's speaker. We have joining us Dr. Gary Hyman. Dr. Hyman serves as vice chair and undergraduate director and professor in the Department of Genetics at Rutgers University. And the focus of Dr. Hyman's research is at the intersection between genetics, psychiatry, and neurology. One of the projects we'll have an opportunity to hear about today focuses on um, his investigation of genetics of Tourette's disorder and associated disorders. He also is investigating the genetic relationship between epilepsy and depression. Dr. Hyman is a fellow and an officer of the American Psychopathological Association. He's also the chair of the Columbia University Seminar in Genetic Epidemiology. So Dr. Hyman, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. I, I did step down from the genetic epi um, program at Columbia a few years ago. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm happy to talk about um, our project and the challenges of team science, um, especially multi-site international studies, which our study is one. So I'm going to start the... Uh, so uh, the Tourette International Collaborative Genetics Study, or TIC Genetics, um, and I just wanted to you know, show it as, a, as an example of team science. So, and so uh, this is funded by the NIH, NIMH. Um, it is a collaborative R01 mechanism, which is a little different than a lot of people have. So there's multiple sites, each is a site, has a, as a PI of an R01. And we were also funded by the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Conditions Disorders. So my outline for today is the first, just sort of because of the people may not know much about Tourette's and, and associated conditions, I would talk a little bit about phenomenology and the genetic epidemiology of the study of, of, of the disorder, and then talk about the tick genetic study describe the study, and then very briefly, very summary uh, on the, our recent findings. And then I really want to talk, because of the, the projects of what, you, what you're trying to get at, is, is talking about team science challenges. You mentioned it before. So I'm going to talk about some challenges and how do you try to overcome some of these challenges. So phenomenology and genetic epidemiology. So um, Sorry, I don't have much of a French accent, but Gilles La Tourette uh, well, uh, in 1885 described a set of patients. His his supervisor, supervisor Charcot, told him to describe these patients. He did that on a paper and therefore got named after him. Um, it's characterized by both motor and phonic tics. It is a neuropsychiatric slash neurodevelopmental disorder. I'm basically the same. Um, and it used to be called Tourette's syndrome. So TS, TD, uh, I sometimes change it back and forth depending on what I'm, my mood. Okay, what are tics? So tics are short, rapid, recurrent, rhythmic, non-rhythmic stereotype motor movement or, or vocalization. And they 
categorize them in both either simple or complex and of course motor versus phonic so simple will be like just an eye blinking um or or a complex would be some more more purposefully seemingly purposefully moving uh so like you know reaching out and tapping things um so it's not just a like a, a tick kind of idea a, a, a blink and the same goes for the phonic ticks as well so the current definition the dsm-5 version of it is you need to have multiple motor and at least one phonic tick that sometime during your illness they have to wax they can wax and wane constantly in frequency but it have to last more than a year onset is before 18 and it's not caused by substance abuse other medications or other medical conditions now as opposed to when you know we typically at least the dsm we are a uh, splitter group um and genetics maybe not so much but in so there is other tick disorders and one of uh, one I just wanted to point out is these other chronic tick disorders. So Tourette is a chronic tick disorder, but you for these other chronic tick disorders, you could have just either motor or vocal. You don't need it both. Um, and I'm not going to even talk about the provisional and the other ticks. The reason I'm talking about that is genetics not ne uh, often um, doesn't agree with our splitting of these disorders into different categories. So the epidemiology, um, so the prevalence, it's relatively common for a genetic condition, you know, between, you know, one, you know, like basically 0.3 to 2.8%. And that varies by setting. Um, and if you include these other tick disorders as part of being affected, it's higher in youth than adults because often um, the ticks can somewhat go away for some people, um, although that's controversial. Um, and it's higher in, uh, although they may be high, uh, go away in adulthood, the other comorbid conditions like OCD, ADHD do not go away. Uh, it's higher in males than females, and as far as we know, worldwide. So, in, I'm going to summarize the sort of genetic epi of the uh, of what's known. So many family studies have shown that Tourette's is familial, and there is you know from the heritability studies, there's evidence of, of a genetic component. Uh, these other chronic tick disorders that I mentioned before um, are seemingly biologically related to the manifestation of the genes. So. Evidence suggested that we shouldn't biologically in these genetic epi studies, you know, we should not separate them, but currently that is done. Um, and therefore, in many of our genetic studies, not in the treatment studies and, and all that, um, we combine these Tourette and these other chronic tick disorders and call them any chronic tick disorder. Okay. There's also shared uh, evidence for shared etiology for these tick disorders and obsessive compulsive disorder. That's sort of what re interaction that was talking, you were talking about before with neurology and psychiatry. Um, and there's been, you know, research done on the relationship between these chronic tick disorders and ADHD. And there is some evidence, at least in the individuals who have the disorder, although not in the family studies, there's a little uh, mixed results. Also, there seems to be a higher rate of autism in ASD, autism in the individuals who have uh, these chronic tick disorders. But it's complicated because unfortunately, the studies have not been really done well or not, um, um, they're, they're mixed results or not, uh, not uh, haven't been done at all. So that's it for the genetic epi. We're gonna switch off to tick genetics. So tick genetics, um, is the study is the goal is here to understand the genetic architecture of these chronic tick disorders. So we are trying to get a well characterized sample, um, use a state of the tech a, art technologies, you know, sequencing, genotyping, um, to understand the genetic architecture. And we're focusing, you know, there's a area, uh, sort of two camps in some ways in the um, in the in the field of genetics, you know, doing 
uh, complex disorders where you do uh, like GWAS, genome-wide association studies, and that's the common variant, common variant rare disease. We're more on the rare variant, rare di uh, common, dis common disease, rare variant hypothesis. So we're looking for rare variants that contribute to increased risk for these chronic tick disorders and the comorbid disorders. And so we're focusing our studies on these rare de novo variants where we collect trios, parents and kid, where the kid has the disorder and neither one of the parents and you know maybe not the siblings as well have the disorder. And what we're doing is we're comparing the, gen the genome, the sequence or the exome of the kid versus the parents to try to um, filter out variants that are not really important. And that's the, the design we're using. Um, and since we were funded by NIMH, NIMH requires that if you have a, a grant of a certain size, you, you have to uh, upload the data into these sharing repositories. So not only will we do the research and get the, the analysis, but ultimately this is set up to be uploaded to these sharing repositories. So not only the phenotypes, but the genotypes and the sequencing. So um, in our study, there are multiple times of people. We have the clinical people, you know, neurologists, psychiatrists is one of those disorders that crosses that discipline between neurology and psychiatry. Um, social workers, psychologists, who are sort of seeing the families. We have geneticists who are doing the, you know, a lot of the molecular and, and work. Uh, we have statistical or computational scientists or geneticists. And uh, we have laboratory people working, doing the sequencing, the genotyping and uh, verification of these variants. Um, of course, we have to have project coordinators and research assistants that are uh, helping out with all of this. And, and lastly, we do have neuroscientists who are thinking about the issues around the brain and how these variants might change and what might be happening with uh, with these variants. So team science, yes. So uh, here's a uh, current picture of base, basically the, the PIs of the uh, tick genetics. So you could see we're around the United States and Canada around Europe, Israel, and South Korea. All, all these sites are doing the same protocol, which is sending a self-report questionnaires to the people, recruiting people, ascertaining them, recruiting them, and then if they say yes, you know, sending a self-report questionnaire out, they complete the self-report questionnaire, the clinician will then review that questionnaire and ask follow-up questions and to confirm that the disorder is is real rather than something else that a person may not realize. So, um, the, you know, that's our model of how to do this. Um, and so we have to, you know, translate all those self-report questionnaires into all these different languages um, at the beginning of the study. One of those challenges. Okay, so in uh, 2017 and 18, we published two papers on looking at these de novo variants, coding variants, and structural variants uh, to, uh, in the pathogenesis for Tourette and other chronic tick disorders. So in summary of those um, results, compared to people who are, um, compared to controls, uh, we found that the cases had a higher rate of these de novo damaging sequence variants in the exome, the you know the part of the genome that codes for the um, codes for the proteins, um, in, uh, higher in cases than controls. And then we also had a higher rate of de novo structural variants, these copy number variants, or you know uh, you know pieces of DNA that's either been added or removed from the uh, the genome, but new variants, which are all these are very rare events, okay? So, and then it was interesting that we found that there was an overlap of the sequence variants that had been found in the OCD studies. So that sort of, you know, explains some of that OCD relationship. And some of the structural variants also uh, overlapped with some of the genes that have been found for autism.
So again, that relationship is sort of making sense in the genetic sense. Okay, we found that there have, now that we've gotten more and more families, we found that there were um, new, you know, there were recurrent de novo variants in the same gene in different families, not necessarily exactly the same variant, new de novo, but multiple families had the same bad de novo variants in the same gene, meaning that that gene was, you know, very relevant and very significant for us. And we would call them the high confidence genes. Uh, we estimate based on just how many new high confidence genes come around by how many families, we sort of estimate there's probably over 400 genes that each contribute to the chronic tick disorder. So we're not in the world of cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs, sickle cell, Huntington's. This is multiple genes can either can cause this. Um, we estimate that about 10 to 12 percent are caused by a de novo mutation. And but these individuals, once they have kids, can pass that gene on to their kids. So we, we, we've been sort of looking at a sort of a generational time in these de novo variants, but then pass they can pass that on. And we, as we put into the, as we got more and more of these recurrent high confidence genes, we put them into a database to figure out what they do. And the, what came out of this um, currently, it could change, is a term called cell polarity, where you have to have a sort of a top and a bottom of the cell. And as the neuron during, during neurodevelopment is, is you know trying to find its partners, it needs that top and bottom to find its partners. And anything that could disrupt that finding its partners can cause a neurodevelopmental disorder. And that's sort of, yeah, that looked pretty good. Now, obviously that could change as we do more families, but that's where we're at at the moment. That's our working hypothesis. So in summary of, the, of that, we, you know, we found that there was increase in sequence variants in the simplex uh, uh, cases as compared to controls. We found that excess of de novo structural variants compared to controls. We have some high confidence genes in which cells R3 is one of them, and we're doing some interesting um, functional studies with cells R3. Um, so, and that talks about that cell polarity component. And as you can see, you know, with Tourette's, it, the, the, there's an overlap of the so single nucleotide variants, the sequence variants as compared to OCD and the structural variants overlap with uh, autism. Okay. So that's sort of the, give you that full, um, I mean, obviously there's a lot more to it than that, but I wanted to just keep it at a 2000 foot level here. So now we're gonna talk about team science challenges, which is really what the, this talk is about. So there are many challenges in multi-site international collaborations. And as you sort of said, we have people from different disciplines, but we also have people from different countries who might have some different ways of doing diagnoses and also the issues of, of the language is, is not exactly the same when you're trying to con translate from one um, term um, to another, like in a self-report. Um, and so in putting it together, a study like this, you need to find people or groups that are responsible sort of overseeing and sort of resolving these challenges. And I'm gonna be talking about these challenges and the people involved the rest of the talk. So this is just some of these challenges. So obviously when you're designing the study, you need to think about what are the main study objectives? What is the analysis that you're going to do? But other people in the group might wanna have other studies. They might want to publish other things from the data. So that's part of that. Um, you have to design that at the beginning. Um, obviously, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, is the publication and, and authorship issues that come up a lot in when you have so many people involved. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, people who are working on the field, the clinicians, are, are thinking about on a, on a treatment perspective, you know, they have their patients coming in and they're trying to treat them, 
but um, when you're doing in a research realm, you have to sort of think in a different mindset. You know, you know, what is the definition that we want to include? What assessments were we going to do? Because they may not be uh, universal, the different assessments. Um, how do you, what are the coding in conventions? You know, for example, if somebody's an adult and they don't, they're trying to remember if they had these ticks back when they were kids and they say, well, I was, you know, mid teens. Well, what do you do? What is that age at mid teens? So, you know, we have to come up with that when that that's the best that they can remember. We need to come up with a co coding convention for that and various other, even how do you do the disorders? Um, of course, Phenotype consistency across sites because they there might be very, you know differences in how they're diagnosed um, across sites and as new people leave, as people leave and new people come on you have to make sure it's consistent across all of the sites and uh, then maintaining the accuracy over time a little bit of uh, you know you think of um, mission creep kind of concept when things change over time um, and people get a little, you know, forget about when you train them early on and how things do go later on. And also um, how do you prevent missing data or, you know, and making sure that you're diagnosing uh, people correctly, at least consistently. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, there's the other research objectives for, um, and how, how do you handle when, somebody wants to do a paper on some of the clinical data, even though your study, the main study is a genetic data, genetic study. So here's the structure of, of uh, tick genetics. So we have a steering committee. We have all of our clinical groups of so recruiting and phenotype assessment groups. Uh, so these are the sites around the world who are recruiting families. Um, we have the genomics and the statistical analysis groups. So people running this, the data, um, doing the analyses. Um, we have a publication committee who deals with any times when you're going to publications going to come around. Well, I'll be talking a little bit about that. And the data coordinating center, which is me. Uh, so uh, I'll be talking about that as well. So just remember, these are the different groups. And I'll be talking about these as we go along. So the steering committee has to design the study at the beginning. Um, and so we need to define the main objectives of the studies. You know, what are the analyses that we're going to do that are, these are the, these are what we're going to do as the main study, as opposed to other analyses that could be done. Um, of course, we, the steering committee needs to design the protocol, you know, how do you recruit families? How do you, or is it, is it, is it families? Is it singletons? Is it, is it trios? Is it multiplex families? All that is part of that designing phase and writing the grant, obviously. And what are the inclusion exclusion criteria? You know, for example, if somebody has a pretty severe autism and Tourette's, do you include them or not? Um, if they have cognitive disabilities, do you include them or not? And so those are the decisions that are part of this thinking process that as you go along, you want to make sure it's clear. I, it, often that's in the grant. And so it's not, uh, but it's, you know, it's not a question later on, but it's, but when you're designing it, it's important. Um, how do you, in the grant, do you uh, deal with the funding to, of the different sites? Is it subcontracts? Do you have uh you know, for example, we currently have a, uh, a coordinating site in Europe and a coordinating site in South Korea. Then they um, work with these individual sites because they're, you know, different time zones than I am. And um, how do you how do you fund them? So we use the collaborative R01 mechanism for the USA sites, for most of the USA sites. That's a um, a mechanism where each site is and has an R01 and there's a site PI, but the, the grant is basically the same except for, you know, the budgeting and the, and some of the administrative aspects and what that, that site is specifically going to do. Is it going to be recruitment? Is it going to be data analysis? Things like that. So um, we use that mechanism rather than sort of that pyramid style where there's one grant that everybody does a subcontract off of that, although that 
collaborative R1 doesn't work on the subcontracts to the international side. So those are subcontracts for us. So it's important to sort of think through this, how you're going to get through the, um, the structure financially of the study. Uh, and of course, you have to deal with the structure of the study, which is that picture I just showed before. Um, the steering committee is also the, in the ultimate arbiter between different groups or different peoples as things come up and that things do come up um, and it is uh, sometimes a struggle. Um, but that, but you know, somebody, the group, the, the steering committee is the are the people who are um, in charge of finally making the decision in that regard. And then around authorship and other aspects, uh, the steering committee um, create created a uh, uh, an MOU, a memorandum of understanding of what the the study is about and what it what what is the issues around authorship of which I will talk about in a little bit. So specifically now about the publication and authorship issues. This is obviously, if anybody's been in a study that has many people, um, this is a very contentious issues when you have multi-site, multidisciplinary studies. And so the steering committee needed to define the guiding principles of the study. And then they created a, you know, we created a memorandum of understanding of the of, of that um, guiding principles. And the guiding principle here for our tick genetics is that all members should be given authorship credit when it's appropriate. And also all members have access to their data for their own research ob objectives. And going on from that, again, with uh, publication. So as I mentioned before, there is the main objectives of the study, but other people might have other objectives. You know, um, how is this clinical aspect or, phys, you know, a medical condition related to people who are having a disorder, things like that. So if they want to use that kind of data, um, how do you deal with that? So um, the our, the way we run it is that individual sites cannot separately publish on the major objectives of the study, the genetic architecture of any chronic tick disorder. But for these other research objectives that are not part of that, there are two ways of handling that for us. One is what we call community data, in which data is used in a publication or analysis from more than one site. So if it's been more than one site, we call this community data and any community data uh, uh, paper is considered a tick genetics paper and all the co-authors are included um, of tick genetics. If it's a uh, analysis um, from one, just one site, that's um, then it's they can publish on that data um, after the publication committee, which I will talk about in a little bit, reviews to confirm that is just one study and it meets that all the criteria. So that we'll talk about the publication committee. But again, this is the MOU of how we structured the study to try to minimize some of the problems that come up. So, and then we have a description of how do you do the authorship as well. This is a challenge happens all the time of who should be, what order and all that. So the primary authors are the, are the first yeah, the authors are the integral in conducting the analysis and research. Then the senior authors are at the end. And then the remaining authors are alphabetical in the middle. Um, and then we have people who are uh, acknowledged in the acknowledgement section because they don't meet criteria for authorship. And so we have now switching off from the steering committee, we're switching off to the pub phenotype assessment committee. Can I ask you so a these... question? Can I sure. ask you a question? So um, are, uh, the site PIs, like is it possible that a site, one of the MPIs on the study is acknowledged and not an author? No, all site PIs would be uh, considered an author. Um, what? So what we define them as being, um, I'm going to be talking about that in a minute of how who becomes an author or not an author. Uh, let me get back. I'll get to that in just a minute. Okay. But yes, okay. they would be authors, the site PIs. Okay. 
Okay. So um, the phenotype assessment committee are the people who at the beginning of the study, you know, needed to define what is what is included and not included, the definition. Um, and, you know, in the different studies, you know, are you going to use the which criteria you're using ICD? What do you include subsyndromal disorders in the, as part of being affected or not? Or how do you handle that in the analyses? Um, when you're designing the study, you need to decide is it going to be a structured interview, you know, or just a self report or a semi structured interview, clinician administered. Or, and of course, you have to translate these into different languages. And when you're translating, you need to make sure that the that it's translated in in the local language. You know, their Spain Spanish is not the same as USA Spanish, as an example. Um, and you know, UK education system is different than USA education system. So we had to make sure that the categories of you know, primary school or secondary school had the right language for people in the in different um, different parts of the world. Um, how do you handle people who are have you know the sub syndrome? They're not quite meeting the criteria. How do you handle that in the analysis? Do you include them or not include them? Often, people who are trying to remember what that was like when they were kids, if they're an adult now. They don't have a great memory of all this. How do you handle when there's a diagnostic ambiguity? Also, in some ways, um, people don't always read the criteria and they don't fit into exactly the, the current criteria. How do you handle when people um, don't fit that exact criteria? Is, is there a, um, how do you handle that situation? You know, would do you just put them in a totally separate category or you sort of force them into that? square peg and a round hole kind of idea. Um, so what we've been doing a lot is, you know, is these diagnostic overrides. So they, we override our typical system or we're unable to rate because they're just, they're not a good historian maybe of, of their symptoms. So we just use this word of unable to rate. Um, we flag, uh, and I'll be showing that in a little bit. We flag other disorders that might be comorbid that are confounding the relate the relationship. So, for example, do they have autism or some uh, other maybe a chromos you know other genetic disorder in the family? Could that be related or not? So we need to flag them, but we're not doing a full assessment. So we're not our assessments don't include a full assessment for autism, but we flag it if the clinician has a as a, either they know it because it's their patient or they um, they suspect it and they'll flag it so that we can go back and find that information in our database. Do you use lifetime disorder or current disorder is an, another concern that comes up all the time. Yeah, this person had Tourette disorder when they were 10 years old, but they have no more ticks. You know, do you count them as affected because they had lifetime history or is it only current? And for us, because we're talking about genetics, it is lifetime. Um, so the phenotype uh, assessment committee then created a coding convention because as I mentioned about the issues around age of onset and memory and, and that um, different places around the world might slightly do, um, do things a little differently. And also, um, so, for example, well, I'll come back to that. So um, we need to be really care careful that we're all doing it the same way. We're coding the diagnoses exactly the same way in the database because it, it can uh, vary between sites. Um, and, you know, when people are don't fit that full category system, you know, there, you know, it might be in a, a domain that's more continuous rather than categorical. Um, how do you handle when they don't meet that that exact category? So what we decided to do is the least se severe diagnosis that they can make with certainty. So, you know, maybe they may had these movement, these motor ticks, but we're not quite sure if this was a, a phonic tick so instead of saying they definitely have Tourette's, uh, we would say that they have a 
uh, chronic motor tic disorder, because we know that that's true. We're just not quite sure about the phonic tic. So that's how we would handle that situation, which is really important um, when you're trying to deal with this, because that's, again, a coding convention. And of course, is somebody totally unaffected or are they unable to rate because of their history? You know, somebody's history, I had something, but I'm not, don't have a good memory of it. Um, and therefore, you know, in these genetic studies, you want to try to minimize these false negatives. So you would probably not make them unaffected because unaffected is a really, a means really is they're really unaffected. Instead, we might make them unable to rate. These are decisions that you have to make. It's part of that code intervention. Okay, so now getting into the data coordinating center, which is me. Um, so I need to, you know, maintain this phenotype consistency across sites. So, you know, we've checked doing internal checks. We have created a database that will um, do a lot of that work for us. Um, I need to maintain the, uh, the coding manual as it might change over time. And of course, when you're planning a study, you have to do these ethic boards or the uh, IRBs. Um, and that is amazingly more difficult than people realize. It, when we started the study, we didn't have the smart IRB system, which is now, um, I guess, required by NIH to, to so that one site is doing it. But it still is not as easy as people might think. Um, and that only really pertains to USA sites. It doesn't pertain to sites outside of the United States. So in Europe, we couldn't do that. So we still have to deal with each country's and even within the countries, I remember, you know, within Germany, I had two sites or three sites, and each site had a totally different IRB stuff uh, concerns within that. Um, so um, it was a frustrating time dealing with the uh, various IRBs at all these different sites. Um, and then we created this online uh, diagnostic database, which I will show you. Um, and that is a website that people log into and enter the diagnostic information into. And that's where our data is for the data analysis. Um, no PHI, you know, can be included because, you know, not only United States, but the GDPR of, of um, the of all of the European Union is stricter than the, um, the United States IRB. So we had to be very careful on what would be included and not. So, for example, no uh, date of birth is allowed to be in that database, but we need to get the age correct. Um, and we use this data to upload to the sharing repositories for NIH. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about these, this little bit more about the, our database system to try to minimize some of the problems. So our... Um, Gary, Gary, um, I don't know how much more you have, but we're going to try to end on time. So there's 15 minutes. And yeah, I'll be done. Sure. Questions. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so our database does have these internal checks. Um, you know, we do have, uh, it doesn't allow you to submit if there's missing data, and it does check um, the data for accuracy. So here's a, uh, our da diagnostic database. We have these tabs for each of the diagnoses, and this is our clinical summary one. So in the di in the demographics, I would just wanted to mention that we would enter the date of birth in, but it's not kept in the database, but it's used to calculate the age. And it's really interesting because Korea had a different way of, of saying somebody's age, although I think this recently changed that. So uh, we, we want it to be consistent. We don't want to say that they're a different age in that regard. Um, for each of the diagnoses, we have the criteria at the top, the person would put in if they had each of those criteria. And then we have the diagnosis that they make at the bottom. And if somebody forgets to put in, let's say an age of onset, if there's a disorder, the, the database would say, hey, you need to add a, an age of onset. So we're minimizing missing data. They also, if after they put those in and the criteria and the disorder do not match, it will give you an error saying you got a problem here and then you can go back because it's easy to click off things that are not, you, you made, made a mistake. So it prevents some of the data entry errors. We have the flags, as I mentioned, for other things. And then we have a summary page that you cannot submit the case to the coordinating site, which is down here, 
unless you've gotten rid of all the red at the top, which is any missing data. Um, so we don't get much missing data because of this. Um, the data coordinating site does serve as the contact PI, um, and I'm not gonna get into the deep details of that. So of course the data coordinating thing must be effectively communicate across disciplines. So to be able to, I would like to call it translate between the clinicians the laboratory people and the statistical people to be able to have that communication to translate for people what this means, what they mean by something, because that can be a little difficult sometimes to have speak a different language. Um, so the publication committee is where these other research objectives come into play. People, what we do is we have a form that the, the, the sites fill out. This is the publication they want to do. Um, this is the amount, the data they want. It goes to the publication committee after the after the data coordinating center reviews to make sure it doesn't conflict with anything or a past one. And then if it's approved, it's approved for a period of time. So that's we have a publication committee that just deals with all of that. Um, of course, authorship issues do come up. You know, we have the uh, uh, the requirements from the journals. Um, and how we did it is that the anybody who, this answers your question, Nancy, anybody who collected the primary data, like the clinicians, are considered co-authors. Anybody who analyzed the data, considered co-authors. And then for other people who are, let's say, coordinators, but they went above and beyond what they would did get paid to do, then they could be potentially co-authors as well. And the site PIs tells us that. Um, and then of course the data is sent back to the data coordinating center. So um, I'm almost done on this. So obviously the steering committee also needs to deal with, even with an MOU and all of the things that we've done with, misunderstandings can arise across sites and across people. And we need to have the, the steering committee or the PC, depending on what the responsibility is, um, need to discuss it and come up with uh, a, a change, and then we send the de decision to the community to, as a, for a vote if they want. Um, and that's it. Any questions? Well, I have one. You sort of got to it at the end. That was very interesting. Thank you. Um, so I can't imagine how much work it must have been to lay out all these systems. I mean, it's unbelievable to design them and think about them, but systems never work perfectly. So, you know, um, do you have a, like, if you sort of got to it with the MOU in the end with the publication, like, do you have, a, can you, can you tweak the systems? Can you be nimble? Yes. So as I, as I was trying to say at that end there, yeah. So yeah. some things have come up over time and we have, we have changed the MOU. Yeah. accordingly after a vote has been taken but even uh, because... the database if things aren't perfect right like yes. the data collection right. do you have to change yeah. that? that went through a whole lot at the beginning um and we're currently unfortunately it was written in an, a software that's not um currently be used at all and we need to move it to a new server and that new server will not allow us to use the old software so we're currently in the last five months been updating the software and then moving it to a new new server because that old server is going to be dying soon. So I'm in the middle of that right now, but yes. Um, and then, you know, there are some things we can tweak with the database. Yeah. Um, Gary, may I add a question? Really, really interesting and important work. And thank you for really such a comprehensive overview of, of the work you all, you and your team are engaged in. Um, beyond sort of the ability to keep so many balls in the air at one time, could you sort of talk to us about the skills or competencies that are most critical for leading these cross-site, multi-site international collaborations? So, uh, you know, I mean, I guess it depends on what, you know, there's, I don't want to call it I'm leading. I'm just, a, I'm the data coordinating center and and on the exec steering committee and sure. on the publication. Yeah, it's, it, but in, in, some, in some ways, it's sort of a, a shared or distributed approach to yes, leadership, right? It is. It is a shared leadership. And, you know, we do, it's not just one person who makes the decision. You know, when it needs to go to the steering committee, we have a, we have a conversation, we, we take a vote. Uh, when it goes to the publication committee, it has to go, goes to a vote. And then, after a decision that affects a lot of sites, we will then send it out to all of the site PIs around the world and say, this is now the change. If you have a problem, let us know kind of idea. 
um, and we can talk about it further. But this is really nobody's really had a like because we're trying to be very careful and you know acknowledging people's efforts and and all that. I mean, there a lot of these people don't are not researchers, so they are you know they're happy to be on these big publications that are being published and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, it seems to me that just being very intentional with the planning efforts and sort of the where the responsibility lies in this broader like architecture seems to be critical to the success of this particular yes. initiative. Right. And you know, but things still arise even though you don't think you think you got them all and like you no, know, <laughs> you got another one. Sure. Sure. Um so I have a question. You you mentioned uh, translation in a, in a couple of ways. One is just, you know, the instruments to different countries and languages, but also the translation across team uh, groups and across disciplines. So I was wondering if you can um, kind of uh, tell us more about some of the challenges that, that you've had or, or maybe the, the team more broadly has had in translating um, uh, you know, among the various uh, members yeah. of the team, the various disciplines, and how you've dealt with those challenges. So, for example, there might be a uh, a question on you know how we handle a certain case of uh, of a disorder and all that, and but it comes from the statistician side of it. Like they they, they don't want, uh, for example, the unaffected concept. You know, we don't want a false negative. But, you know, um, I have to then explain that to the clinician saying, OK, I know you think they're unaffected, but if there's something going on there, we need to. And, and there's these symptoms that you might be seeing. So I'm I have the background in, as a clinical aspect, too. I try to explain to them from the statistical, so from the statistical reasoning why they should make this person unable to rate. That would be one example of those of be able to talk it through from different point of views or oh, we have this variant in this we need to now go back to this case and say could you tell us some more about why you know this this let's say this gene also has uh, is associated with autism so we might go back and say okay you know without saying the gene has something to do with autism we all say I, was there anything else in the family that was going on that might you know you know beyond the statistics so I, it's hard to explain, but I, it's it's sometimes um, it's not as clear cut to, to t getting information from one side to going it to the other side to make sure it's clear to everybody. Does that make sense? Uh, it's it's yeah. hard because it's it, you know, I, I don't have a perfect example of it, but it, you know there is the ability I need the ability to be able to tell different people in in their language that they know. I don't mean. English, I mean, in statistician, clinician, and all that. Yes, Nancy. Um, I mean, it sounds like a very democratic organizational structure, but it's, I, I mean, I've done multiple PI R01s with two or three MPIs, and it's just hard to imagine that all those PIs got together and put together this proposal. And Please tell me that there's like a smaller group that like was much more yes. intimately involved <laughs> in the details. <laughs> right. So all those site PIs were not involved with designing the study. Okay. They are the site PIs and they're, and they're basically, for some of these people, they're all they are, they focus, they're, they're a treating physician and they do the recruiting, right? So they weren't part of that. Um, so who's so the whole group of PIs? The, the, the steering committee. And okay. the public and the phenotype assessment committee, because they had to make sure the diagnoses were correct and stuff like that. Um, and but the the steering committee had both clinicians and geneticists on on that committee, so they understood that aspect. And they all have run multi-site studies in the past. They've also been involved or run these sites since the past. So it's not like the they're the first time they've ever been through this. Um, and so they they knew what kind of things to deal with often. So they, again, the steering committee were the people who mainly wrote the grant. If that makes sense. About, which was like how many people? Uh, five. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah five or six, depending on what, you know, the grant and stuff like that. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's not all of the, I mean, but 
but they are all, we try to include, you know, comments from people, but they didn't even read the grants. You know, remember the Europeans don't even weren't in part of the grant. The USA sites, we would have to, you know, so for example, when we have to do a progress report, I do the progress report for each of those collaborative R1s. I do the progress report and I send it out to them to tell them, this is the language you want for this part, but you have to fill in the budgets and everything for your part. Got it. I hope that this is what we're looking for. In, yeah, it's uh, going to be, it was great and going to be, I think, so valuable to folks who are, are watching this recording, wanting to learn more about the, the opportunities and challenges of engaging right. in team science. It is a lot of challenge. It's a type of study. Um, it's a very unique type of. Well, I, I'm, it might be more common than I think, but it's. I, I don't know of any studies like this. You know, myself and um, using this mechanism. It's yeah. I find that the collaborative R one it works nicer because they feel that they're a part of it, and also these sites, they are also a, a PI on an NIH grant, which obviously looks good for their career, right? Yeah. Now, not the Europeans, because they are the Koreans, because they they can't be. But for us, for the 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 USA sites that are gram submitters, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, no, this was uh, really an, an impressive uh, amount of work. A, a really um, uh, helpful way to see how you've organized it and, and uh, you know, all the uh, challenges that you face, the ways you've approached them. And um, we really appreciate your time and your insights. Um, and I just want to also thank, uh, you know, you who, who are listening to this, thank you for joining us today in the, in the seminar series. Uh, and just as a reminder, um, you can go to the NJ Axe uh, team science website to see uh, more uh, recordings of seminars in the series. Uh, and if you have questions about um, you know, how to form, organize, manage, or lead uh, research teams, or questions about team dynamics, performance, or uh, any other questions about team science, please feel free to uh, request a consultation. We'd be happy to share um, resources or, or, or meet with you. So thank you very much.